Hello, <laughs> my name is Anne-Marie. I'm joined today by Dickon Bettinger. Um, he studied and it was fully qualified as a psychiatrist and for 10 years... Psychologist. Psychologist, sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, after he was practicing um, for 10 years, he met Sydney Banks and started looking towards the three principal ways of um, looking at psychology. So my first question for you, Dickin, which I say it's a question, it might be three questions. Um, so your first 10 years in normal psychiatric practice, when I say normal, sort of the standard education system modality, um, and then you met um, Sydney Banks. So I'd like to explore how you met Sydney Banks and also um, when you were practicing psychology for the first 10 years, were you looking towards other ways of practicing psychology before you met Sydney Banks or was it a case of you met Sydney Banks and then it was like a big revelation and something changed, something shifted within you? Well, I had been practicing as a psychologist for 10 years before meeting Sydney Banks. And I wasn't wedded to one way of working. I was passionate about trying to find things I could share with people that would help them have an easier time of life. That's how I got started. I actually got started as a high school English teacher. And I had so many kids coming to talk to me about their problems that I wanted to know how to help them. So I got my master's degree in counseling psychology and then a doctorate in counseling psychology. And all I was interested in is what can we teach people that would help them have an easier time of life. And I never saw people as having mental illness. I never liked that way of looking at people. Um, so I found a program in a university in the education department that trained psychologists in the education department with an understanding that we all have difficulty in life. Who doesn't? And if we're having difficulty, we're not ill and it's not our fault. We just haven't learned what we need to learn to have an easier time of things. And so it was based around learning and insight as the way people could change. And I like that because it, put, it leveled the playing field. In other words, I'm a student who messes up, but can learn things that help me have an easier time. You're a student. We all mess up. You can learn things that will help you have an easier time of things. So that, that's still <laughs> my philosophy. <laughs> We're all mucking our way through life, and then we learn things that help us have an easier time. So when I studied psychology, then I studied everybody to find out what they concluded about how to help people. I wasn't so much into what their theory was as more of, okay, I turned to the last chapter of every book I read. And I was reading three books a week on helping people. And I turned to the last chapter on, okay, here's how you help people. Here's what you have to teach them. Here's what they have to know. Here's what's helpful. And so I studied, I studied, oh, Thomas joined us. I, I studied uh, all different approaches in psychology, seeing them all as valuable ways of helping people. But every one of these ways in psychology focused on something that had already happened to people, like what they had been thinking, what they had been feeling, and what they had been doing. 
So there was cognitive schools, there was Freudian schools was cognitive because they were interested in unconscious thought. So there was the cognitive people, there were the existential humanistic people who focused on feelings, and there was the behaviorist, and I studied them all, but in, I didn't realize I was just studying the past, people's past. Like people would come in and say, how was your day yesterday? Oh, I had a fight with my mom. Okay, let's talk about it. What were you feeling? What were you thinking? What did you do? And every approach to psychology that I studied had suggestions for how to focus on thoughts, feelings, or behavior. Okay, so the whole field of psychology was focusing on the material aspect of the world what had already taken form. Then I meet Sidney Banks because I had heard people say he was someone who had an enlightenment experience. And I also had spent my life studying spiritual teachings and spiritual teachers and I was meditating four hours a day when I met Sid. Very, very interested. So I had thousands of books on spirituality and thousands of books on psychology. And they seem like two separate worlds. One was you pick up thinking about the past and focus on it and think about it and talk about it. That's therapy. And the other is you let go of your thinking to experience what happens when you let go of your thinking. So one picked it up and the other let it go. And both were an important, hugely important part of my life. Hugely. I loved meditation because I was able to, after hours and hours of meditating, my mind would finally begin to quiet down and I would experience unconditional love and presence and aliveness and go, I can see what the fuss is, but I'm still a neurotic son of a bitch. And I better work on myself. So I did dream work and cognitive therapy, working on my thinking and trying to reframe it. And I did uh, affirmations and my wife used to, I slept four hours a night because I had all this work on myself to do. And it's also what I realized after meeting Sid, not only was I constantly working on what had already happened in my life, old news. In other words, I became wedded to memory that was painful as a way of getting healthy focusing on it, thinking about it, talking about it, memory of what happened, what I felt, what I thought, what I did. So without realizing it, I was wedded to memory, wedded to the past, and wedded to the material aspect of humans, not the being aspect of humans, right? So uh, the fundamental assumption in psychology was that you get damaged by things that have happened to you in life. But if you work hard enough, you can gradually develop mental health, but it takes so much hard work. Years and years of therapy and working on yourself, and then you can eventually develop. And even spiritual teachings were based on many, most of them, not all of them, were based on developing oneself, becoming a better person. And it's going to take years of meditation, 20 years of meditation. And I it was just scratching the surface, right? I was already doing three week meditation retreats in silence thinking I, I'm going to have to do three years of silence go to the Himalayas and sequester myself in a room for three years. I was considering that, right? I was going to go to India. I was going to, you know, and I was very much involved with meditation teachers. 
And then I, I meet Sydney Banks. No training, no teachers, no therapy. Ninth grade education, welder. And he had something that's very rare in human history. I do believe there have been others where he had a absolute spontaneous enlightenment experience. And, uh, but anyways, when I met him, because Anne Marie, you asked about when I first met him, he was the most ordinary looking guy I've ever seen. A Scottish welder who just walked into the room and, hi, <laughs> thanks for coming. When I looked into his eyes, I knew this man knew something. I don't know how to say it. I mean, any of you who've held the baby and look in, looked into the eyes of a baby would have a sense of what I saw when I looked into Sid's eyes. Absolute pure presence and light. Eyes are the windows to the soul. And by that time, I had spent so much time thinking about myself that the light had gone out of my eyes pretty much. <laughs> so I noticed his eyes, I guess. That's what I noticed about Sid first was, oh my God, <laughs> he'd just fall into this space of presence. And here's my metaphor, Anne-Marie. You wanted a metaphor, it's not a map. This metaphor was what I would relate to as my, before meeting Sid and after meeting Sid, what happened. I'm looking out at the world and seeing lots of people and so there, you can't help but to compare. And I had an enormous amount of compassion for people who were suffering because I had done my fair, of, my fair share of psychological suffering. And I also saw a lot of people that I thought were way more developed than me and I wanted to be like them. And so I had to work my butt off to try and become healthier, wiser. So I was always working on myself. I had no idea how self-involved I was. So when my wife says, I don't know anybody, I've never met anybody who works harder on themselves than you do. 24-hour job, you're working on yourself. And I thought that was a compliment. <laughs> She's basically saying, you're not in the world. You're in your books, in your techniques, in your doings, in your work on yourself. Later on, I had to crawl on my hands and knees to beg her forgiveness for being an absent husband, father. I mean, I love my wife. I love my kids, but I was preoccupied. My kids called me space cadet because I was so preoccupied. So anyways, here's my metaphor. I think I'm a little wave on the ocean because I look out and I see lots of big waves. So my conclusion is this little insecure wave needs to become like a big secure wave. So I took lots and lots of seminars and read about how to become a bigger, healthier person. <laughs> nothing, please don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with this. I'm just presenting. Sid had a different way of looking at humanity than I did. That's all I'm saying. It's just different. You don't even have to say it's better. It's just was a way of looking at 
humanity that was much broader than how I was looking. I was looking at egos and comparing and feeling insecure is just I'm little and I want to be big. And it's going to be through self-effort. So I took webinars on how to become a big wave. And then I saw some of them had curls and it was like, I got to take the curl webinar. And then some had foam flying off. I got to take the flying foam webinar. And, and then I got to, and then the rainbows and the sparkle seminars and more work, always more work, effort, effort, efforting, effort, trying, searching, efforting, thinking that was requirement for getting where you needed to get. And uh, so I meet Sid Banks. And basically all he said was look within. That would be like saying to a wave, instead of looking out at other waves and comparing yourself, look down. Look down, little wave. No one is more ocean than you. No one is more spiritual than you. No one has more well-being than you. You've just been looking in the wrong direction. You've been looking at the world to form. And we're only a teeny bit form. And the rest of us, are, we're human beings. We're infinite being, infinite energy of life. That's our true self, our true nature is the ocean of consciousness, the ocean of energy. And that's very scientific because that's how all the physicists were starting to talk about the quantum field is an infinite field of formless energy out of which form is created and dances into existence, right? I had two worlds that seemed separate, the spiritual and the psychological. And all of a sudden they came crashing together. Every one of it, I started seeing everyone as having perfect well-being because we're connected to this infinite ocean of life energy. And the characteristics of the ocean, not of the wave, the characteristic of the ocean is universal characteristics that Sid realized in his enlightenment. The whole field of life energy itself is wise, intelligent, knows how to create something out of nothing. That's the miracle, the absolute. No one can understand or explain this. The intellect can never understand this, that out of nothing stuff appears. And if you look around you right now, everything you see did not exist at one point. It came out of nothing. Look at a baby out of nothing. Then there's two seeds coming together and then they have a party and then all of a sudden it multiplies, multiplies and, it, and the different parts become different systems and then the systems get organized and work together and it's a miracle. It's, Einstein says either you see miracles everywhere or you, you don't see any. As everything that exists, that, that that we exist is a miracle, that I'm sitting here, that I can see you and talk is a miracle, that, I, that you can sit there and listen and sit on a chair and all of that is the miracle of birth, the miracle of new life taking form. Oh my God, still, I just, I just, anytime I reflect on that, it blows me away. It's just like, cool, I'm sitting here living, being lived by nothing. All of us are. And the nothing is not nothing, it's everything. It's three fundamental universal characteristics. You can say three fundamental forces that are in life. They're not ideas, they're not theories. 
there is something, there is an intelligence behind all of life that knows how to create life. Something does it, knows how to do it, and it's formless. <laughs> this is quantum mechanics, the subatomic particles of matter are temporary condensations of energy that appear and disappear in the quantum field. We're just appearing and disappearing on every level of our physical being. There's not a single cell in your body that was here seven years ago. You just keep being created and then dissolving back into the formless. That's the dance of life. That's the one principle that Sid talked about, that from nothing comes everything. And that's the inside out paradigm of life. It's scientific. It's the only way it's ever worked. It's the only way it ever will work. That's how life works. It's created from energy. It is energy. Every particle of life is energy condensed temporarily. No exception. So it's intelligent or wise. We have to say it's conscious because every cell that is ever created has awareness. It's made of awareness. It responds to light and pressure and touch and every cell does. It's awareness Awareness is not inside us. We're inside this ocean of awareness and we're made of awareness. We're made of intelligence. We're made of creativity from nothing into something. Those are the three principles, the three universal characteristics of the fundamental nature of life itself. And it's wise enough to create life. It's aware enough to that everything created has awareness. And it's creative enough that specific forms are created. So everything in form is different. So each of us on the physical level is different. On the spiritual level, we're all the same. We're all infinitely, everyone, no exception, infinitely wise aware and creative. So the beautiful discovery is when we fall out of our thinking that says we're not wise, aware, and creative, we experience directly a felt sense of being open to new and fresh thinking and feeling. We're we, as we fall out of our thinking that says we're not, we become more awake and aware in the present moment. Our senses come alive. And as we fall out of our thinking that says we're not, we become wise in the sense without thinking about things, we know what to do that works out well for us. Common sense, clarity. I've seen no exceptions to this for anybody I've worked with. So we can discover that our true nature is human, physical, being, spiritual, and they're all one. They're connected. And I don't know, that's just the coolest thing I've learned my whole life. It immediately made me a better parent. The first, after my very first training in the principles, because I started realizing I'm in my head all the time, thinking, 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 and it makes me uptight. And I don't parent well when I'm uptight. As a matter of fact, when I open my mouth, I sound like my dad when he was upset. I was channeling my condition. <laughs> and then I start going, oh, that's just my thinking. And when I'd fall out of my thinking, not only would the thinking fall away, but the feeling of upset would calm down or fall away. And I found out when I parented from that feeling, I was a completely different parent. I was an unconditioned parent. I was wide awake, creative. Things would occur to me to say and do that I, that I couldn't find in a book. 
I stopped using parenting manuals to guide me. I started using my own common sense, which was just what made sense to me to say or do when I was fully present and in a better feeling than my uptight conditioned ego self. And I'm going, this is a, I could be a good parent, like immediately, <laughs> no matter how I was parented, no matter what trauma I've been through, no matter how neurotic my personality can be, when I fall fully present, none of that exists anymore. I'm not a past, I'm not a, conditioned being i'm just aware of presence and there's a feeling to that that's inviting to people safe my kids can tell when i'm safe and when i'm not safe i'm finding out all animals can tell when you're safe or not safe we just had friends here visiting we have a little puppy and he's cautious about new people. It's like, who are they? And are they coming here to hurt me or not? And, and very cautious. And my friends are just present and warm. And before you know it, he's jumping up on their laps. You know? People can tell when we're fully present and when we're caught up, up tight, and then we're a little dangerous. <clears throat> we fight or flight from our conditioning. You fall out of that and different hormones get produced even and oxytocin gets produced when we feel love and compassion and that calms us down and makes us all warm and cuddly. And so it was like, I have my ego parent, which is full of my memory and conditioning. And I have my whole being parent, which is just an ordinary schmuck who doesn't have a clue how to deal with my kids. But when I'm in that state, I, I seem to do great. <laughs> it was my great discovery. I was, oh my gosh, just being awake to what state of mind I'm in when I parent is all it takes to become, be a parent that's not working on it and trying to do programs or techniques or my daughter who was a teenager knew when I talked to her from a book I read. She said, oh dad, geez, what book have you read now? And I'd say, oh, you're wondering what book I've read now. I said, yeah, I am. Oh, you're really wondering. No, I'm pissed. Oh, you're really pissed. I'm, I'm listening to you. I hear you. You're really pissed. She said, you've read a book, haven't you, that says to parrot back whatever I'm saying. Stop it. And I said, I'm active listening. This, I just read this great book about active listening. She says, I know. I can always tell when you've read a new book. And when I let go of all of that and had no clue what to say or do, I responded to her authentically and with presence and caring. And she could tell the difference between when I was being myself, parent. It became apparent to her <laughs> when I was myself, parent, or when I was the latest idea, parent. So I tried to answer all three questions at once, Anne-Marie. You did really well. <laughs> I listened to you all day. Um, <laughs> the thing that <laughs> occurred to me while you were talking was I was engaged to a scientist and science, the scientific community traditionally tends to be quite anti-spirituality. Have you got any, I mean, obviously the three principles is very- I, I think yeah. that's a myth. They're anti-ideas about spirituality that are prevalent. I, I worked for 16 years with engineers and big corporations and they love the principles. You know why? Because they love logic. 
So you say, the power of thought creates our thinking in our head, just like electricity creates the possibility there's light in the light bulb, or there's the computer can compute. So there's a power that creates our thinking and whatever thoughts are created, we're going to feel. One plus one equals two. It's logical. It's logical that if you take your old thinking and temporarily set it aside, that you're going to get new thinking. And we have an amazing capacity for new and fresh. The mind is full of possibilities, like you talk about in engineering. You see, I learned to talk their language, but I presented the same logic to them I would present to a four-year-old or to someone with an addiction or someone who was struggling, same exact logic. And so engineers love this, you know why? Because it helped them perform better, think better, think clearer, be more uh, resilient, be more agile in the face of change, be more creatively responsive, to communicate better, to get over their stress quicker, to do teamwork better. I mean, they, they loved what came out the other end of understanding. And they could appreciate the fact that we're built to have insight and new thought. And so as soon as they heard the logic, they were all over spirituality. At, at some point, some of them would say, you're just talking about God. I say, well, then you can, can use that word if you want to. The infinite, creative, wise, loving energy of life, or you can call it energy, or you can call it potential, or their words that point towards something beyond the computer, beyond the machine, beyond the physical. It's a power, it's an energy, it's a source. And they could appreciate it. So, but they don't like theories, but they could not argue with the fact that all human beings think, that all human beings are aware and that all human beings have a mind that's capable of much more than we had that any, that any of us can realize. No argument at all with the principles. None, they could, what can you argue? <laughs> I've been all over the world with this. What can you argue about? No, I've never had somebody say, no, we don't think. I don't think. I'm not aware of anything. Uh, uh, I don't have a mind. That's, that's their universal truths that have always been true, always will be true. We are intimately connected to a dimension of life that's not often talked about or thought about, but that it's logical when you consider it. Yeah. So I'd love working with skeptics and scientists and engineers and the physicists one time met with Sid Banks and he told them why Einstein's E equals MC squared had to be wrong. Even though he was not a physicist, never studied it. He just asked, what does E stand for? What does M stand for? And, and he said, that can't be right. <laughs> and he told them why he thought that wasn't right, just based on his common sense. And they said, oh my God, that's the the, the latest scientific thinking is exactly what is the exactly the, the criticism uh, that is being made in the scientific community. So there's no conflict that I've, there always historically has been a conflict between science and spirituality and because they weren't seen as united and 
Sid said, if you can see the connection between formless and form, it'll change your life. It opens up new possibilities. You gain a deep respect so that when you have a problem, instead of running into your stored information bank, thinking the answer must be in there, you fall open to a deeper intelligence that can bring you new ideas. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, what if we do this? What if I do that? What if I... And you get the best of both worlds and you find a balance between your intellect and wisdom. And we get out of balance. You can see people when they're uptight and out of balance in life, it's really easy and happens to all of us, still happens to me. I get, I get caught up in my thinking and it seems true, you know? And then at some point though, I wake back up and go, oh, whew, fall out of that thinking and the tension, stress and upset dissolve. And then there's more clarity and then new and fresh starts coming in. And we're all built that way. That's what I love about this. Everybody, everybody, the people that have been labeled schizophrenics, they still have access to wisdom and deep feelings of love and connection. It's not damaged because it's formless. As my psychiatrist friend, Bill Pettit says, uh, no one's broken or damaged, right? Because our true nature, our core is formless. We are both form and formless human beings. Just one last question from me and then I'll open this up to see if anyone else has got any questions. Have you ever come across somebody who's very anti-spirituality or and you've had to have a conversation with them about it? Yeah, everybody. We are just scratching the surface of beginning to realize that we are infinite beings. So everybody has a problem with that in a sense. But everybody is the same. On some level, everybody knows we're more than meets the eye. Everybody on some level already knows that because it's true. A wave can believe it's a little teeny wave like I did for years and years and years. Even though I was studying spiritual systems and meditation, I never made the connection that this little wave was connected to all of that. Right. So in a sense, we all have more to realize. Sid Banks, when he became enlightened, said that wasn't an accomplishment or an achievement or the end of anything. It was the beginning of appreciating the true nature of life and that he would continue to have insights. One time he said, every minute of every day, I have a new thought. There's never an end to learning on a physical level. So we'll keep learning more. No one can say I couldn't possibly be any more loving, compassionate, creative, wise, right? On the physical level. So we're students. I'm an eternal student of this formless intelligence that keeps informing me. <laughs> I've learned so much just this last year, having COVID and going through all of that. And I have had some, of, some amazing new and fresh insights. And there's no end to it. It's limitless. So the best thing that can happen for a person is they stop thinking I know or should know and begin to realize I'm just open to a knowing that's not physical. I'm going to open it up now. Has anybody else got any questions or comments they'd like to address to Dickin?
You can just unmute yourself if you do. Yo, that was... <laughs> Hi Dickon, great yeah. to be here with you and thank you Anne-Marie for the invitation, such a pleasure. I've, I've loved hearing you talk and I wanted to mention something because the last time we spoke you told me about your friend who owns horses and how they behave completely different based on your state of mind. Yeah. We have four horses out here on our little farm and I tested it recently. I was in this calm, clear state of mind. And I said, honey, give me the carrots. I went out to the horses. They were different horses because two of them are quite wild, but they can genuinely sense your presence and state of mind. I thought it was the brand of carrots we were feeding them that was, <laughs> was disagreeing with them, but I just wanted to flag that. <laughs> then my question, Dickon, and Marie reminded me of something, so I changed question. She asked you with the scientific community, can it be hard? I love dealing with the scientific community like you because they're so rational. And with the business community as well, a breakthrough for me recently has been to make it even simpler. And when they love the simple, they grab it because mm -hmm. they don't want to be burdened. So it, it has been a game changer. Now, the community that I have struggled a little bit with when I volunteer in the Heartfelt Presence Room has actually been the spiritual community because I find that they, and that is a wide net I'm casting, but they are wedded to the idea of having ancestral lineage that they need to clear or past life trauma that they need to regress and edit. And um, this idea, as, as you said, with, with um, talking with Bill Pettit, I think that we're not broken or damaged. That's very hard for them to meet because they believe that they're doing the work for their family line and their mm -hmm. history and they're, um, <clears throat> that it's their job to break these patterns. So not the scientific or the business mind, Dickon. Do you have any advice for dealing with the, yeah. the ultra spiritual mind? If I can simplify it, there's one human problem. All of us at times get caught up in ideas and think they're true. That's suffering. Because, like, can you imagine getting caught up in a concept about love and think that's love? And you're wedded to that idea about what love is and what it should look like and how it should be. And so anybody that seemed to be behaving differently from that, you'd be very upset. Because I did that for years. You can get wedded concepts are of spirit but they're not spiritual in nature so if i get wedded to a spiritual idea like i did for years and years and years it still creates a kind of i'm spiritual you're not i'm right you're wrong this is the way it is not how you see it innocently so you have holy wars even Right, which are just people wedded to different beliefs, saying, "I'm we're right, you're wrong. If you but believed what we believe, you'd be fine. And what Sid said is, like, that's normal. We all do that. And that's why we get upset with people or intolerant or impatient or righteous. We all do at times. But there's a feeling to that that lets us know we're wedded to thinking. And now when I feel tension, stress, or upset, not all the time, certainly, but a lot of the time now that feeling is like, oh, I thank, thank God I feel that way. It's letting me know I'm wedded to my thinking, period. And Sid, so Sid says, if you really see that your tension, stress, or upset, your insecurity is created from thought you're wedded to, 
this will happen. He said, it'll bring you right back to the now. Why would I hold on to something that hurts me, that stresses me, that upsets me? Just like you put your hand on a hot stove. Why would I keep my hand on the stove if I know that's where the pain's coming from? And without technique, without theory, without belief, we take our hand off the stove. When, when I work with clients, when they really see that this uptight is th holding thought, they let go. No technique. I don't have to explain to them how to do it or teach them how to do it. They begin to more and more back away from their thinking rather than lean into it. Most adults, when they're having a problem or difficulty, think harder. And with understanding, you begin to, in a sense, think less. You fall into the unknown. Why? You find clarity there and you find peace of mind. And then out of that space of clarity, this deeper intelligence brings us new feeling that's uplifting and new thinking that's creatively responsive to any situation, any situation. So it's just understanding the principles is unfortunate because it's really standing under our intellect, not understanding it intellectual. I don't understand the infinite formless nature of life, I can intuit the truth of it. Insight. Oh, this too is thought. And it, it says, if you really see it, it'll bring you back to the now. And when we're in the now, we're like babies and babies don't get stuck in feelings. They flow through them. When I'm in the now, I'm like the sky. Another metaphor, in marie <laughs> Consciousness is like the sky. And then thoughts are like the birds flying through. And the, the sky has no problem with any bird flying through. So there's an old Chinese proverb. Don't let it, the proverb is, let the birds of unhappiness fly through the sky of your mind. Just don't grab onto one of those birds and have it build the nest in your hair, <laughs> or I should say, on my head. <laughs> you know, when we nest with our thinking, we're caught up in our thinking. I can't believe this person did this. I, I can't stand this. I feel so bad. I should have done this. Why did I say that? I'm, I'm going to talk to this person. And then all of a sudden, wow, all of that thinking that I'm holding is holding my tension in place. When people become newborn, born again, fresh start, wide open. When our mind is open, our heart's open. And when our heart is open, when we start to, when the feeling changes from tension to expansion because our body can only do this one or the other when it's expanding that's another way of describing what love is is just the natural expansion of life energy when you take your fist off of it and open your hand what you held now instead of contracts expands so I can feel horrible and there's nothing wrong with that. We all feel horrible. And if I know it's thought when I fall out of my thinking into the now, and you can do this anytime you want to, you can just see what happens if you literally let go of every single thing you're thinking. Don't believe a single thought that comes into your head. Just be open in spiritual teaching. They often talked about just resting not searching, no searching, no trying, no getting somewhere else, just resting and being yourself as you are in this moment, feeling shitty. But then it, the feeling shitty starts to open. 
The sadness opens, the hurt opens, the insecurity opens. And it's a different feeling as it opens. It's the same feeling in a different form, same energy, but instead of condensed, it's expandive, expansive. We feel more open, we feel more spacious. Mm -hmm. open, <laughs> open heart, our natural state. We we're born that way. So they call this listening. So I'd say listen. And in listening, there's presence. That's what the horses respond to. That's what my kids respond to. That's what now my grandkids respond to. Is when I'm present, I don't have an agenda. I'm not trying, I'm relaxed. And there's a feeling. So Sid would say, it's all thought. Wake up to the now and listen for a feeling and bring that presence into the world. You're literally bringing more love and consciousness into the world, literally. It's turning this back into its natural state of expansion and then bring warmth and kindness and creativity and your common sense into the world. And that's how we create healthy relationships. That's how we create healthy companies, healthy communities. And that's literally how we change the level of consciousness of the whole world by bringing, raising our own level of consciousness, bringing more of this energy into the world. It's a neat vision. So that's what I'm committed to to now is helping to improve, wake people up to their innate well-being one by one throughout the world. And that's how the world will change from the inside out. Mm -hmm. That was Sid's vision that he shared with us all the time. We can change the world not by becoming a different person and going off to a different place, right where you are, right at this moment, you can raise your level of consciousness. More love, more compassion, more understanding, more kindness, instead of more ego, more tension, more stress, more duality, more difference, more right and wrong, more judgment, right? Lower levels of consciousness, higher levels of consciousness. What level are we bringing into the world? Now it's its question to us. Right, we have five more minutes left with Dick in. Has anybody got anything else they'd like to add? Or oh, Claire. Hey, Claire. Hi, Dick in. Hi, you. You know, when you said about um people being in that expansive lovely place yeah where is there anything that we can do to help somebody when they're in that shit storm and when you're looking at somebody in front of you yeah because they can't hear they can only they're in it no. aren't they yeah what would people you are, say people are incredibly responsive to just presence one one time just as an example claire Presence is primary. So I used to think I should figure out how to help this person and what to say. So I'm in my head thinking about how to help this person. See, you see the irony of that? I'm uptight trying to help someone who's uptight. Something wrong with that picture. So the only thing I can do is when I surrender into the unknown where I don't have a clue what to say or do because wisdom knows. There's a feeling that already affects people. So one time I saw Sid Banks walk into a room for we were having dinner at a friend's house and he walked in and there was somebody in the group who was really struggling and having a rough time. And he walked in and he's so tuned in 
And he has so much compassion for how easily we get caught up because we all do it. He had so much compassion for that. It's like, oh man, that's suffering. He, he, I watched him. He walked over and sat down next to the person, didn't talk to him, he just sat next to him. It would be like a cat curling up on your lap. Mm -hmm. Exactly like that. Or, or handing someone who's really upset, hand them a baby. Watch what happens. I saw one of the most uptight men in, in our office one time, and for two days he was in his intellect, and then a baby came into the waiting room and he went, oh, oh, hi, baby, oh, and he got all present and in deep feeling, and the person who was working with him saw that happen, and they went upstairs and they said, that's all we've been saying the whole time. If you wake up out of thought, you fall into that space you're in with the baby. And that'll change your relationship with your wife and kids. That alone. Don't worry about what to say or what to do. Just get familiar with that space that's always here, one thought away. Sid would say, you want to find your well-being? It's always one thought away. And I'm trying to figure out, of course, what the thought is that... <laughs> How am I one thought away from my well-being? You know, I'm feeling really shitty. And he would go, you one thought away from you. And one time he said, you know what that thought is? <laughs> my ego got all excited. I'm going to memorize whatever thought he tells me to have for my well-being. He says, it's the state of thoughtlessness. He says, you find that where you don't hold the single thought. I guarantee you'll find your well-being. Okay, so you're with someone who's uptight. You don't have to know what to say or do. You find thoughtlessness, which is just presence, which is just ordinary, which is the best give, the best present we can give is presence. And then sometimes in presence, things just occur to you to say or do. That's wisdom guiding you and do that. And you won't find that in a book. It's coming right in the moment, fresh from this deeper intelligence. Perfect for you. Love letter from God just for you. Mm -hmm. A little guidance at this moment. So you put your hand on the person or you don't. Or you move closer, or you move further away. Or you say something or you don't. All of that wisdom will guide you. You don't have to think about it. You fall into this space of presence. And then it's sort of like the magic happens. So you stay with yourself, Dickon, is that what I'm hearing? You just stay you, with yourself. You come home to yourself. That was the metaphor I used in my book. We're lost in thought. We've gotten away from home. We come home to our natural state, which is this wide open presence, awareness just like when we're babies. And then this deeper wisdom will bring us the feelings and thoughts and, and whatever we need in that moment will bring to us, but not of the intellect. Not as, like when you're driving your car, you don't think about, I got to turn now, I got to turn on my signal, I got to do this, I got to do that. And you're making life and death decisions when you drop out of your thinking and you don't know what you're doing, but you're making life and death decisions, right? It's the same in life. I used to think I had to know with my intellect how to respond to my friend who was suffering. It just happened yesterday. I was with a friend who his daughter got involved in some very difficult things. Just was tearing them apart. And I got quiet and I had no clue what to say to him. And I'm comfortable with that because mostly I just listened. And at some point I just said, oh man, I am so, so sorry for you guys. But it was not my words. It was the feeling and presence that affected him. We had a big hug and 
his wife said to me later, I'm so glad he had a chance to talk to somebody about this. It's really helped him. And all I did was not know. And he's my best friend. I haven't seen him for two years. <laughs> he lives on the other side of the country, but I was like, I didn't know. I used to think, okay, I got to remember what so-and-so said I should do and how I should listen and how to be compassionate. And I'd try to help. And just like my daughter would bust me every time going, oh, Jan, geez, what book do you read? So it is true, Claire. What you just said is very profound. You literally be your whole self. The ocean self that includes the wave that includes our bodies but now we're open channels and then we get the benefit of the whole power of the ocean that's not personal <laughs> not personal is that helpful clear it is thank you i think my intellect was trying to help the person you know remember the three p's what's happening in the forget three, the, forget and it's the three p's <laughs> the last thing you want to be doing when you're with a friend who's suffering is be thinking about the three p's yeah. you know you know what i mean sid says you want to find well-being look for the state of no thought mm. it's the opposite of what we think think we should do at times like that, which is to analyze and figure out and figure out what to do and how to do it. And the paradox is we fall out of that. And this deeper knowing is not passive. We're not withdrawing from the situation. We're falling into the heart of life so that we can be moved from the heart to respond from a deeper level than just the intellect. Mm. That's what Sid meant by be your self, <laughs> ocean self, mm. not wave self, ego. That's not your true self. No. It's 20 past and Marie. <laughs> I'm just being you, you, you and you and Claire got the light shining in on you. <laughs> uh, both of you are sitting there just beaming with light. Uh, thanks for having me, Anne Marie. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. It's very kind of you. Thank you. And it's been a real treat to see you folks there looking back, waving back. One wave waving to another wave is like oh. wow. Really wonderful being with you. Okay. Love you guys. You too. Take care. Oh, I love you too. Bye. Thank continue you. Being, be, continue being just an ordinary person who doesn't have a clue how to do anything, but wisdom does. <laughs> You're in good company. Wisdom has your back. Or as my friend Elsie says, wisdom is your back. Right? That is your true self nature get out of the way and wisdom will guide you okay Thank take you. care bye. folks you too bye 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 in. bye say hello to oliver yeah. i will i will right now <laughs> he's waiting for me <laughs> bye bye, bye.